All right. Good afternoon and welcome to the Engagement Initiative uh, webinar. I'm Patty Johnson, coordinator of the Southeastern Council of Foundations Engagement Initiative. This afternoon we're delighted to present our program, The Cottages, A New Form of Care. This program is sponsored by the Daniel Foundation of Alabama, and our presenters are Maria Kennedy of the Daniel Foundation and Jennifer Ray of St. Martin's in the Pines. Maria, I'm going to turn it over to you to get us started. Great. Thank you, Patty. Um, we really appreciate this opportunity to share this concept with you. I am Maria Kennedy, Executive Director of the Daniel Foundation. We are based in Birmingham, Alabama, make grants throughout the state. And just to kind of give you a little bit um, about us, part of our mission is to improve the quality of life for Alabamians. When it comes to um, our elderly citizens, many of our grants have been very basic. They've involved care management, home adaptation, meals, health programs, mostly small grants to small nonprofits that could truly impact and benefit the elderly who are living at home. When it came to the elderly living in a group environment, there just seemed to be fewer opportunities for us. Um, we've made some small grants basically for programming, uh, mostly with Alzheimer's patients, or we've made some grants for some renovations to facilities. But at best, these seemed only to maintain the quality of life. They didn't really get at the improvement that we wanted to see. So when St. Martin's came to us with this cottage concept, we actually had the opportunity to participate in improving the quality of life for this segment of the population. Supporting the cottages allowed us to be a part of bringing something new and innovative to our community. It took me a while at first after they brought this concept to us to even realize that this wasn't just a, a new twist on assisted living care, but this truly was an alternative for nursing home care. And once I was able to wrap my head around this, this really was something very excited. Um, but, you know, I just I found it to just be something that we really needed to be involved in to change these lives. I remember as a child going to a nursing home and just not really caring to be there. The environment was just kind of sad and institutional. The quality of life was really missing. And when we uh, were able to visit the cottages, it was a completely different experience. There was a family environment. It was warm and inviting. It was a place that actually can change a resident's outlook on life. This is what Jennifer was kind of able to share with me when I took a tour of the cottages. Um, some of the family of the residents were there to take the tour with us, and they were really sharing their stories about the impact that this new environment had on their family members. Some of them were, were going from a just very little will to live to actually enjoying and participating in their environment. It was just an improved quality of life that we wanted to be a part of. Since our initial contribution for construction of the cottages, we've also made an additional grant for training. Um, that tour that Jennifer gave me back in the spring of 2011 just really solidified for me that this is truly you know, one of my most favorite grants that we've been able to do. Um, Jennifer has been involved with St. Martin's um, and with this concept since it's they were first exploring it. She has worked in the nonprofit arena for more than 16 years and with St. Martin's for 10 of those years. She is currently involved with programming and fundraising as the Director of Development, and she has been instrumental in raising more than $4 million of a $5 million capital campaign to construct the cottages. She can finally see the end coming as they wrap up their fundraising efforts by the end of this year. I would like to really thank Jennifer and St. Martin's for just embracing this concept and bringing it to Birmingham, and also for being willing to share their story. They've done it many times in many ways on local, state, regional, even national levels, and have really been an advocate for the improved nursing home care. Jennifer is passionate about this project, as I'm sure you will see, so I will turn it over to her to share it with you. Thank you so much, Maria. Wow. Didn't know had had such a fan in you. Um, well, thank you and welcome everybody. I'm going to tell you today about the cottages at St. Martin's and how we have worked to reintroduce home to nursing homes. So usually I start off with saying 
when you think about a nursing home, what is the first thing that comes into your mind? And I always tell people, be honest. Um, after working here for 10 years, I can tell you that 90% of the words that come out of people's mouths are sad, depressing, death, hallways, people screaming out, just bad memories. Um, I, I get a lot of stories of people telling me about visiting their grandparents and just how sad it was. So <clears throat> I always thought start there because I think you have to start with the problem. It's sad. It's depressing. And when we first started looking at our nursing home several years ago, we had to actually stop and go backwards and say, why? Why is it so sad and depressing? Why is it so institutionalized that it looks like a hospital? So we kind of went all the way back to the early 1900s to do a little bit of history on it, and we um, really learned about where nursing homes started. Well, back in the early 1900s, there was no federal assistance for the elderly. There were these wonderful little places called state-run bar poor farms and almshouses, and actually they were really sad pictures. The pictures that you see are just these sad little depressing places, and I can't think of a worse name than a poor farm. Um, you know, you just certainly don't want to think of a loved one ever having lived on a poor farm. So um, back in 1935, the Social Security Act started granting funds to the old age assistance for retired workers. However, anyone living in an institution or in one of those almshouses was not eligible. So that created a, an additional problem for those. Um, and then after World War II, we had a lot of soldiers returning home that needed a lot of medical care. Senator Lister Hill of Alabama actually co-sponsored the Hospital Survey and Construction Act, which is known as the Hilburton Act, um, to build and fund state-of-the-art hospitals throughout the country. The first hospital was actually built in Alabama with those funds. So we had all these wonderful state-of-the-art hospitals in 1946, and all of a sudden we had lots of empty hospitals. So what became of those empty hospitals? Well, you got it. They became nursing homes. So for the next 54 years, every nursing home that was built was designed on the institutional model. If you've ever walked through a nursing home, you can pretty much picture it in your head, the long hallways, the nurse's station, there's the activity room, the sliding glass doors, everything looks just like a hospital. St. Martin's was actually opened in 1955, and we were a brand new nursing home to the Birmingham area. We were one of the first in Birmingham to open, and yet our hallways are long with tile floors, brick building. It looks just like a small hospital. Every few years, they would add on a new addition, a new corridor, a new hallway. And so typically what you find in most nursing homes is this snowflake pattern of a centralized location, which is the main nurse's station, and then all these long hallways that shoot off of it. So it brings to beg, beg the question of why. Why did we continue doing this for 54 years? And Really, there's no perfect answer other than no one really ever dreamed of it looking any differently. No one ever stopped and questioned it um, until Dr. Bill Thomas. Some of you may know him. To those of us in the elderly industry, he is like a god, a semi-god. And um, he is a wonderful little hippie from upstate New York, and he stopped and questioned it. Um, when he first started practicing, he accepted a position of medical director at a nursing home in upstate New York. And he came to the realization that life in nursing homes was not what it should nor could be. Um, he quotes the story as beginning when he walked into his very first nursing home room to talk with a patient. And the elder looked up and said the words that he will never forget, I am so lonely. He says at that moment he was awakened and he has never gone back. He and his wife then formed the Eden Alternative, which is a really wonderful program that has helped a lot of nursing homes throughout the United States and the world in changing their environments to be um, better. He is the founder of the Greenhouse Project, which we'll talk about later. He is also the author of What Are Old People For? How Elders Will Save the World, which is a really fabulous read. I suggest you all read that and also is now the founder of the Changing Aging blog stream, which is a really incredible resource tool for all of you. So he came to believe 
that the nursing home system was broken, that we were simply treating our elders for their illness and for their frailty. Our elders were suffering from the three plagues of the human spirit, as he says, that are loneliness, helplessness, and boredom. And he knew of no drug or ointment to prescribe for this. He recognized the only way to combat, combat these plagues was to change our entire medical model of nursing homes. We need, needed to transform our institutions into vibrant human habitats filled with variety, spontaneity, companionship, and opportunities to give as well as receive care. He had a dream. He dreamed of starting with a blank slate. And he literally started with a blank piece of paper and sat down with groups of people and said, what could we do? How can we bring home back to nursing homes? He found a nursing home administrator in Tupelo, Mississippi that felt the same way, and together they created the very first greenhouse home. Here in Alabama, we always joke that for once Mississippi actually beat us at something. So they had the very first greenhouse home in the country, and it is still in operation today, and we'll see a picture later on about that. So the entire philosophy rest on three major changes, elements of change, and those are the philosophy of care, the organization, and the environment. The philosophy, the basic philosophy is that these are not patients, these are not residents, these are elders. We should not call them patients because this is their home, this is where they live. So we have given them this new phrase of elder just simply to connote that they are wise beyond their years, that they are the people who have been here the longest and they have so much to offer us. They are the decision makers in their own houses. They contribute to the life of the house. They have full access to the house. This is truly their home and we just work there. The organization completely changes. He's taken that organizational chart where you have the top person and then you know, have the next supervisor and then you have the charge nurse and he's flipped that all upside down to the sorry slides backwards to where the universal care worker is actually the number one person on top they are the bosses of the house along with the elders so the Shabazz replaces the certified nursing assistant and it's a brand new word that he created it's actually a, taken from a Persian word that has a whole wonderful theological story along with it that a Shabazz is a royal falcon to sustain and protect a king that goes along with this Persian mythical story. So the Shabazz is the universal worker in the house. The, there is a clinical team that visits the house. They make house calls and they operate just like a home health system would. So you would have therapy and the nurses coming and going throughout the house as needed when the elders need those people. The teams are all self-managed. They work together to decide their schedules. They, are, they answer to each other, and they are their own bosses, in a sense. Their boss or their administrator is now their coach and their guide. And they all work very hard together to protect against institutional creep, which is when all of those institutional ways start whittling their way back into the house. The third element of change is the environment, and that's probably the greatest, that is the most noticeable to most. Um, it is a small, green, warm, and smart environment. There are 10 elders living in each home, 10 private bedrooms, and private bathrooms. Uh, everything is organized around an open living area with an open kitchen and dining area, but the entire design, the entire house is built around supporting those intensive medical services that are provided there. Each house operates independently of each other. Um, after all, these are still nursing homes. So our solution at St. Martin's in the Pines is the cottages at St. Martin's. And we are landlocked here on our campus. We have 23 acres, and at the time we had only six remaining acres on the back property of our land, which consisted mostly of swamp land. So we brought in groups of architects and we decided to build up. Um, any greenhouse home that you might see throughout the country usually replicates that of its environment. It, it should fit into its neighborhood as best as possible. And most houses here in Alabama are two-story, some are three-story. 
So our cottages pretty much replicate what you might find in a typical neighborhood right here around us. Um, so we're going to just take a tour through the cottages real quick. So the first thing that you'll notice is we're going to walk up the sidewalk to visit the home. And you'll see right on the side there's a garden there. Every elder has access to the open space and to the outdoors. The second and third floors have screened porches. Um, you can see the screen porch up there on the side. And they love those. They sit out there often. The next thing is you're going to walk up and ring the doorbell. In most traditional nursing homes, you walk right through the door. Sometimes you sign in. Sometimes you don't. Sometimes you'll wander around the halls until you find who you need. Not here. You ring the doorbell. The Shabazz answers the door and welcomes you in. They know who's in their house how long they're in their house, who they're there for. And I will tell you, these Shabazim protect their home very strongly. We've had several people come by through here to visit, and they'll go ring a doorbell and ask if they can get a tour. And the Shabazim always tell them that they need to go check in with somebody else. Um, they don't let strangers into their homes. So once you ring the doorbell and the Shabazim open it up, you are welcomed into the home. This is the clay house. And each of our houses is named after the elder living on campus the longest at the time that we moved in. Mrs. Clay was the longest living elder when we moved in four years ago. And so the house is named after her, and she actually still lives there today. Um, this is one of my most favorite pictures of the cottages because it really shows life in the cottage, um, and life as it should be in the cottage. You see the elderly lady sitting right there at the front playing a puzzle by herself. Uh, far in the back in the center, you can see somebody sitting in their room, and she's listening to the radio. In the kitchen, you can see the Shabazim. They're preparing lunch. And then over on the far side, you can't quite see them, but there are two elders just enjoying a cup of coffee at the dining room table. This is truly life in the cottages. Um, the daily activities no longer consist of hordes of elders being brought to and from an activity room. Bingo is not the biggest highlight of the day, although they do still enjoy playing bingo, but it is not the biggest thing that ever happens to them in the day. The hearth area is the heart of the home. That's pretty much where everybody comes to, to be. They watch TV. When their families are visiting, this is where they sit down and they join together. The elders and staff will sit and rest, read the newspaper together. This is just the center of the house like it would be in your own home. So if the hearth is the heart of the home, the kitchen is known as the belly of the house. Um, in our cottages, the Shabazim do all of the cooking, and they are made right there in that kitchen. In the nursing home industry, we often battle with weight loss. And for the elderly, losing a few pounds can be a really very situ serious situation. So um, the biggest problem is that the food is cooked miles away in most institutional nursing homes. And by the time the food is brought to you, it's got a cover on it, and so it's lifted up. You never even smell the food. You never get a chance to actually get hungry. Here in the cottages, the food is cooked right there, just a few feet away from where the elders are. They can participate. They smell the food all day. They help decide on the menu. They contribute with the recipes, and they can even go into the kitchen and cook and bake. Um, now, I don't know if you've ever visited a nursing home or a hospital. But I bet you've never walked into their kitchen and lifted the pot to smell the food. I know I haven't. I have worked here for 10 years, and I have only been in our main kitchen twice. Um, however, when I'm down in the cottages, I'm always welcomed into the kitchen to help or to, to do whatever needs to be done. The dining room is where everyone is welcome. And Dr. Thomas loves new words. so. In the cottages, we do not dine together. We don't have a meal together. We have convivium. And that is where every meal is a feast and every meal is considered a banquet. The staff sit down and join the elders. The families who are visiting are invited to the table to sit down also. Um, meals can sometimes last for two hours. In the greenhouse homes throughout the country, usually our biggest stories involve mealtime. And I know in our houses, we have a lot of really wonderful stories about mealtime, so I'm going to share one real quick with you. On the very first day that we opened the very first cottage in 2008, um, we moved in the first 10 elders. It was a very crazy day, and we had a lot of things on our list to do. Miss Bradford, who had lived in the nursing home for five years, rarely left her room in the nursing home, never participated in activities, and never once sat in the dining room for her meals. 
She always chose to eat alone. Well, the day that we moved in, her son walked into her room and asked where her food tray was. Well, we hadn't thought about that, honestly, because we just assumed everybody would sit at the table. Well, he insisted that his mother would never sit at the table. So I had to run out to Bed Bath & Beyond to buy a bed tray because we try really hard to keep those institutional things out of the house. And so whatever you would have in your house is what we have there. So I came back, and I came back the next morning and found out that Miss Bradford had actually asked to eat her meal at the table. And since then, she has eaten and taken almost every single meal since at that table with her new friends. Um, now to me, that is truly convivium right there. That's not in, just enjoying a meal. Um, that's really what, that dining table is truly what makes the cottage different in a lot of ways, is that they actually get to know the person sitting across from them. Um, they know their names. They, they see them. They, they talk to them like they would in an institutional nursing home where there's, you know, 50 people crowded into a room at the same time. That's, that's really one of the biggest differences that we see often in our home. Every room in the cottage is a private bedroom, which is pretty huge for nursing homes, actually. In the state of Alabama, the Medicaid long-term care program only pays for semi-private or ward-type rooms. But St. Martin's believes that every elder, regardless of their income level, deserves to have dignity and privacy. And so typically, if an elder is in a private room, the charge difference is paid by the elder's responsible party. But we have always experienced that our elders, almost all of our elders and their families, cannot afford that additional charge. So we felt it very necessary to make sure that every room was still open to every elder. So St. Martin's is actually committed to serving all the elders, so we've taken on that financial commitment ourselves. And we continue to work with the state of Alabama to try to change that policy. Um, every room in the cottage is private. Every bathroom is private. And that, again, is something that you rarely see in a traditional nursing home. I will tell you, I was horrified the first few weeks working here 10 years ago, um, walking down the hall, doing, going to work like I was, and seeing people with, draped with sheets over them that were headed for the shower. Um, it just felt so very wrong to me that you would take these wonderfully dignified people and just they'd have to be so open to everyone like that. So the private bathrooms are, for most of our elders, what they love the most. Um, at the very top of the picture, you can barely see it, there is a rail system, and the, that's actually part of the lift. Every bedroom, every bathroom is equipped with a lift system. Typically in a traditional nursing home, you have a voyeur lift machine, which is this really large machine about the size of a large desk. And it takes about two to three people to operate. Well, what we have done is we've found a machine that's actually about 10 pounds. It hooks on to a hook that's attached to the rail system. There is a chair lift that then you can then put around the elder to lift them from their bed to a, to a wheelchair, their bed to the bathroom. And those are also in the main living area, so elders can sit in the recliner chairs if they wish to. That is one of the things that we've really, um, that has helped our staffing numbers stay low in the houses. So St. Martin's is actually still the first, we were the first in the state of Alabama to open the greenhouse home, and we remain the only one. But we're not alone, and we have a video, and Patty, are we going to show the video now? Why don't we move, do it at the end? Okay. I didn't get it moved to the end. Okay. My apologies. Sorry. We, we had some technical difficulties with the uploading of the video, so we're going to watch that at the end just in case there's some lag time in people's responses. So we're going to skip on to 20,000. Yeah. Okay. And we'll do the other one at the end. So St. Martin's is not alone, though. We, have, um, we are part of a national project called the Greenhouse Project Initiative. And in 2005, they received a $10 million, $10 million grant from the Robert Wood Johnson Foundation to provide technical expertise in startup loans. And then again in 2011, they received an additional $10 million to continue the support, and this time to really provide additional research, including financial data, which is really needed so that new projects can continue to get loans. Um, proving that the finances are comparable has been very difficult when there are so few of us in operation. 
So that's something that St. Martin's has been really working with the Greenhouse Project on to get started. There are greenhouse homes in 29 states across the country. There are 113 homes open and running and 227 in some form of development. And at the bottom of the screen, you can see three different pictures, images of what a greenhouse home can be. And they all look a little bit different. In the center is the Mississippi Methodist Homes in Tupelo, Mississippi. The very first one started. And you know, what I like to see when I see the pictures is you can really see how they look like they would fit in. The one in Mississippi is on this huge piece of country land. And so they have all these really long houses just stretched out in the neighborhood. San Antonio, it very much looks like it fits into their community. And then the Jewish Home Life Care in New York is a metro metropolitan area. They actually took our inside designs and kind of fitted them into their, their, house, their houses there in the um, uprise. So the biggest question that I'm sure most foundations have is, does it really work? And St. Martin's has been really blessed and lucky to participate in three national evaluations between 2003 and 2009 that really examined the numerous measures of care and satisfaction. We've done our own satisfaction surveys. We've done our own evaluations. And all of our results echo what the national evaluations have said. So we're going to go through some of those features as we go through. Um, the first one studied the greenhouse homes compared to traditional homes on the same campus. For instance, here at St. Martin's, we operate with 60 beds in the cottages and 78 beds in a traditional nursing home. So we actually are kind of operating almost 50-50 in both worlds. So it's a really good way to compare how the care is provided in each of those, because it's the same company, it's the same staff, it's the same atmosphere. So in the greenhouse homes, the elders reported an improvement in quality of life, including feeling that their choices and preferences were provided for. They believed that they're heard. People actually are listening to what they say. Greenhouse families were more satisfied with the quality of care, including improved health care updates and overall communication between the staff and families. And to me, that just goes down to the Shabazim, actually. They know their elders. They know who they are. They know the families. Um, these are the same Shabazim that work. There are eight Shabazim that work on each house, and they just work around each other's schedules to take care of those same people. So it's the same eight Shabazim at all times working with those 10 elders. Mm -hmm. And for most of our houses, mm -hmm. those staff members have actually been there for four years now. So they have known these family members and the elders for four years almost every day. Um, now you can't get much closer than that. Um, the second evaluation studied greenhouse homes when compared to other nursing homes of comparable um, that maybe were in the same city. So the elders actually received 23 to 31 minutes more per day in direct care activities from staff in a greenhouse home without increasing overall staff time, which is meaning you know less dollars. <laughs> so less overtime, anything like that. They actually got 30 more minutes of direct care even though the staffing is lower than in your traditional nursing home. In a greenhouse home or in our cottage, we actually have 10 elders, two staff in the morning, two staff in the afternoon, and one at night. So with only two people, that's a ratio of one to five. They, they can spend a lot more time with those who want to. They can sit down and have that cup of coffee. They can um, spend a little bit more time fixing the hair of the elder the way they want it to be fixed. Uh, it's, it's really wonderful. Um, the next one is one that you see just with the greatest improvement, and that evaluation was on the role of the direct care worker. Um, you know, these are the people who work in the houses daily, in our nursing homes daily, and they are the lowest paid, usually the lowest respected. They're the first to be blamed. Um, they're the ones who really have the brunt of the work. And yet in the greenhouse home, we have found just amazing, amazing stories. The removal of the formal nurse supervision of direct care workers did not compromise the quality of care. So by taking out the nurse, the nurse is no longer in charge of the Shabazim. They're no longer in charge of the certified nursing assistant. They just work in tandem with them. They collaborate with each other. 
the quality of care was not compromised. The high level of direct care worker familiarity with the elders led to very early identification of changes in condition, facilitating timely intervention. Now, like I said before, the Shabazim, they know the elders. They know if Mrs. C isn't herself and can share this with the clinical team, which can often lead to an earlier diagnosis. Um, we have seen many cases where you know, somebody's just not feeling right and the Shabazim will tell the nurse and then sure enough the next day, they test positive for a UTI or for anything else that's going on that could really disrupt their entire health care. The Shabazim have a higher sense of accomplishment with their jobs. I am lucky enough to sit through our annual meetings with our Shabazim, and it's just amazing to hear them tell their stories. Of They feel good when they go home at the end of the day. They all say they feel tired, but they feel good. They, feel like they're connected to something. They feel like they're really helping people and that they are important. They know that if they don't show up for work that Mrs. C is going to ask about them. And that's important. You know, they, they want to show up and be there. These, these wonderful people who do this job, they do it because they love it. You know, certainly they don't get paid the most money, so they, it's a calling for them. And to, to feel success at the end of the day is pretty amazing. So. What we have found is we have happier elders, happier families, happier staff. Um, the biggest one for us is this correlates to a higher retention rate when compared to traditional nursing homes. St. Martin saw a 94% retention rate of direct care workers during a 12-month period last year. That's opposed to only 55% retention rate in our same traditional nursing homes. So same campus, 94% in the cottages, 55% in the traditional nursing home. And we're actually better than the national average is only 45% retention rate. And when you think about that, that means 6% of the Shabazim in the cottages last year left their position, which actually is two people. So it's the same people taking care of the same elders every day. For us, it saves thousands of dollars and hours for training and for everything else, but it actually really comes up to the con continuity of care and the quality of care for the elders. So the last big question that most people ask is, what about the cost? What about the money? Um, well, we are really happy to say that the daily cost to provide the care is the same. Because we have been operating in both worlds for the past few years, we have been able to really look at our financial data and determine that it costs no more to provide care in the cottages than it does in our traditional nursing home. The, the only true cost is in the actual building and in the training of the staff. To become a Shabazz, which is a brand new title, you actually receive about 120 to 160 hours of additional training to become a Shabazz. They're all certified through the health department to cook meals. They go through activity, activity service certification. They receive um, additional training in just housekeeping and entertaining and a um, little bit more hands-on with the nurses. So that's really one of the biggest costs right there is the training. That's our ongoing cost. And then otherwise the building, like Maria said, we are in a $5 million capital campaign to build the third cottage. And um, our cost is actually $5 million per cottage. So that's about $1.67 for each home. And that is at a much higher rate than a traditional home. I actually don't have the data on what the cost is for a traditional home or a traditional nursing home bed, but we know that it's worth it. Um, we are so convinced that it's worth it that we have been working to build the third cottage, and we are very pleased to say that on November 11th, we will open our third cottage to 30 additional elders on our campus. And Veterans Day is also St. Martin of Tours Day, and that is our patron saint and the patron saint of soldiers and veterans, so we really think it's very fitting to open on this day in a really incredible way to honor all of our veterans and all of our elders on campus and in Birmingham. And we're going to go back to the slide real quick of Miss Geneva Troxel. I can get there. Miss Geneva Troxel is 88 years old and she is from Indiana and has lived here at St. Martin's for four years. She spent two years in the traditional nursing home and has been living for the past two years in the Wilkinson House on our campus. And I'm going to hit play, and hopefully this works for everybody at the same time. Hi, 
I'm Geneva Troxel, and I live in the Wilkinson House in Cottage B. Oh, how I love it here. The Chavazines just are perfect. They take such good care of me. And do you know, we have nurses staffing all around the clock. Now, you can't beat that. Oh, how I love the food, and I even get to help bake some. So living here is restful, peaceful, and so secure. Bye-bye. I hope that worked for everybody. If not, you can go back at the end of the slide and see if it'll play again for you real quick. Um, I know we had some trouble when we were trying to do it earlier with the three of us. So, um, so I'm sorry, let me get to my screen. So I want to thank you all on behalf of the elders, families, and staff of St. Martin's. Thank you for all that you do in your communities. And thank, I want to thank Maria and the Daniel Foundation for all that they do. Um, we have really found this to be just an amazing journey um, and one that we continue every day. And we have really been trying to share a story throughout the state and throughout the country with people um, because we've had really great success, as have all of the greenhouse homes that we have spoken to. Um, if you have access to the files, I hope you will write down those websites of the projects that I put up earlier in the slideshow. Um, we are still the only one in Alabama, but are, I'm happy to say that the veterans, um, the VA, is actually building a new nursing home in Tuscaloosa, Alabama that is not completely a greenhouse home, but that has been based on the principle. The VA has a lot of bureaucratic hur hurdles to get over, so they're having a lot of difficulty in doing everything. Um, but we have worked very closely with them over the past year to um, help them along in their process and in the training of their staff. So um, with that, we're going to open it up to questions. And I have one already. And that is, how many square feet are in the cottages built for $5 million? You know, I wish I could say I knew that. But just off the top of my head, I have absolutely no idea. Um, I have no idea what the square feet is. I apologize. But the five million covers will house ten residents. No, five. Yeah, five million is for three homes because we built oh. up on top of each other. We, uh, each cottage has three homes inside of the one cottage, so there are thirty elders living in each cottage. So each home is one point six seven million. Um, and for the life of me, I just don't know the square feet. Don't have that number memorized. Okay, Tina has a question. Okay. I did. Thank you, Patty. Uh, Ashley, thank you very much for this great presentation and to help us understand about this new model and really kind of the possibilities in, in terms of residential care for our elders. I, I wondered if you could maybe comment in terms of um, criteria for um, a resident to be chosen for the cottages versus the traditional nursing home. Okay. That's actually a question we get a lot. Um, we, each house really what we always say is it has to be the right elder for the right house at the right time. Um, I'm sure that there's probably at least one empty bed down there right now, but it might stay empty for a day or two longer until we find the right person. Um, traditionally, if you are coming in from the hospital just for a short-term care stay or if you need some um, short-term rehab, you will go into a traditional nursing home. Um, and then if you need additional long-term care, you can go straight into the cottages. We do offer rehab care in the cottages, but if you're only going to be here for 20 days, it's really better just to stay in the traditional setting for those 20 days. So it has to be the right elder, meaning that we don't want in one house to have 10 elders with really high physical needs or 10 elders with high, um, with high levels of dementia so that the, we, we really need to spread it out a little bit so that the staff are not overburdened. Um, and so that's when I say it has to be the right elder in the right house at the right time. Um, we also want to take into account, you know, there aren't that many gentlemen out there in the cottages. There aren't that many gentlemen left at 88, unfortunately. So, you know, if we have a gentleman who's on the list, we want to make sure that he's going into a house that has another man so that they can talk or watch baseball together. Um, unless they specifically want to be in a house with all women. So I guess I'm an answering that question right now for Deborah. Uh, we actually do have one house, one gentleman, Mr. Harrell, who insisted. He said, I was raised by my mama. I lived with my wife, and I had only daughters. I want to live with all girls. 
<laughs> he is in a house with all women, and let me tell you, he shows up to every tea party. He never misses it. Um, otherwise, it's really just if there are specific requests, we will sure, certainly grant that. Um, I do not think that as of to date in the past three and a half years we've ever had anyone say that they did not want to live in a house with a man or did not want to live in a house with women. Um, we just have not encountered that issue yet. So if we do, we will certainly have to look at that you know, as it comes in. Great. Thank you very much. You're welcome. Did that answer your question, uh, Deborah? Yes. Okay. Great. Okay. We have a few more minutes. Uh, if you have other questions, Deborah, I think you've got another one. All right. What challenges do you anticipate with healthcare reform? Wow. Um, <laughs> you know, we really just don't know. It, it is also up in the air. I, I am really not an expert on that. Um, I will tell you that in the state of Alabama, we always struggle with Medicare and Medicaid, as does everybody, I think, in every state. And it's, that has been a struggle for us as far as the actual health care reform. You know, we're, we're going to continue providing the care that we always have. Um, right now, we are working very closely with all of our hospitals to make sure that anyone that's admitted um, it's not ever readmitted very quickly into a hospital, so um, we're doing everything we can with all of the reform that's coming out. You know, it comes out very quickly and it changes very quickly. It seems so. We just kind of have to stay on top of it. But I, I, I don't really know if the challenges. Uh, I'll be honest. I focus on the fundraising. So unless unless other people around me tell me about the challenges, I'm not always aware of them. Anything? What's the average age? Are most of these people over 80? Or? Absolutely. Yeah. Most, most of our elders are actually over 85 in our, okay. in our nursing homes um, and in the cottages also. Um, so, I mean, really, these are, these are really elderly, really elderly. So, you know, when you think about people in assisted living, they're sometimes in their 70s and early 80s. When you get to 88 and to 90, um, very frail, very, very frail individuals. So um, definitely the oldest. When we moved into the cottages, um, it was a replacement bed, not a new beds. In the state of Alabama, there are no new nursing home beds available. So um, we actually just moved our elders over. And so those who had lived on campus the longest actually had priority. So most of the people that we moved over were the sickest and the frailest on our campus. Mm -hmm. um, and they have all done just amazingly well over there. This is Tori so, DeKaiser with the EyeSight Foundation. Hi. And I was curious to know, um, I mean, can you handle the most acute care yes. in, that, in the um, cottages? Yes. A everyone is eligible for the cottages. We have people with the highest level of dementia. Every cottage is a locked, locked home. So, you know, there's no issues with people wandering or getting out. And because it's such a small space, the staff, they can stand in the kitchen and see every bedroom. Um, so they, they kind of have within their sight at all times every elder in the house. And you can hear, you know, anything that goes on in the house because it's just an open space house. So, you know, when people have higher levels of care, they, they are right there within eyesight, within a few hands, hands reach of somebody. So um, they can care for everybody over there. And we have a question about fund development from Deborah, the mix of funding. Okay. Um, and actually, I, I noticed on one of my, I skipped the one point on one of my slides that um, our third cottage is being built solely on the contributions of individuals, foundations, and corporations. Um, and we are thrilled with that. Um, we, it's, I'm trying to think. We have had a lot of foundation support, actually, from the Birmingham community. When I first started here 10 years ago, there were very few foundations giving to the elderly in Birmingham. And along with the Daniel Foundation, our community foundation, and one or two others really stepped up and put that at the top of their list to focus on. And um, we are really at about, I'm trying to think. Um, you know, maybe only in about 10% corporations, 
maybe 30% foundations and the rest individual donors. We've had lots of wonderfully generous people throughout the Birmingham community step up and support this model. Um, and for the most part, I will say most of the individuals supporting it um, don't even have family members here. Yeah, they're just wonderful people in the community who see this as a need, who see this as something that if their parents ever needed it, or if they ever needed it, they want something like this to be out there. Um, so that, does that answer your question about our funding mix? Thank you. Okay, you're welcome. Okay, and Tori, you had another question about uh, yeah. how this is going. Yeah, yeah if this how is, more, um, more and more providers are moving toward this concept. Absolutely, and we are, you know, the, the greenhouse model is not the only model out there. The Pioneer Network is a really wonderful organization who works in collaboration with the Greenhouse Project on really focusing on more home-like atmospheres in nursing homes. So there are a lot of models out there. When St. Martin's did our research, we found that this was really the best model for us. We needed a new nursing home. We needed a new building. So we felt like we needed to take that next step and build the newest type of building. Um, and every day there's a new model that pops up there into the community, but we really felt like the greenhouse model, the home model, was the best one for us. But there are a lot of providers that are supporting home-like care. Um, CMS is very supportive of the greenhouse project and has actually selected the greenhouse project as their number one mode of model that they most su suggest to individuals organizations. Um, so I, I, I hope that more would, and it, it pains me to see new nursing homes pop up down the street that are built on the institutional model. It truly pains me to see that. We actually had a nursing home built by the same builder who built our greenhouse homes. They built a nursing home less than a year after we opened just down the street from us, and that old institutional hospital-like model, and it just pained me to see it open. But um, it, it's all in the capital, really. That's, that's where the biggest costs are. Okay. We have a question from Tina. Thank you, Patty. Just, uh, and this is just kind of tagging on to what you've been talking about, but you had talked about um, the replacement beds. And I wonder, at the time that you get ready to replace your existing traditional beds, um, are you anticipating um, converting those into the greenhouse model as well? And what, what type of timetable would that require? Right. Um, our original goal was to open four cottages at the same time, um, and that was back in 2005. And so as we started going through the process, you know, the bonding, and then the whole financial crisis of 2008 hit, and the money just kind of disappeared everywhere. So um, we, at that point, went on a three-pronged model. We took out um, funding for the first two cottages, decided to move forward with a capital campaign to build a third cottage, and we would put the fourth one on hold for a short time until we could look into that. Um, we have very little debt here at St. Martin's, and we like to keep it that way. Um, we have a wonderfully conservative board who is um, most concerned with that. So we have not yet decided about that fourth cottage, but that is truly the dream is to tear down the nursing home, completely tear it down and move away from that model. So we just don't have a timetable on that fourth cottage yet. Great. Thank you so much. Thank you. It's about five minutes of four. We've got time for one more question if somebody's got a burning issue. Um, this is Tori DeKaiser at the Eyesight Foundation again. And y'all are probably already plugged in to this, but um, we fund a lot of, of programs and um, efforts that try to uh, bring low vision rehabilitation services to people of all ages. Um, so we've got resources uh, that we could connect you with if you're not already connected. I know that, that one of the things, there have been some studies done on quality of life and assisted living and nursing home facilities, and oftentimes the elderly, um, they, they don't really seek out or have opportunities for eye care because they just assume because they're old they can't see and that's just the way it is when there are all kinds of low vision aids that sometimes can help. Um, and, and so it just helps them be happier in the place where they are living. Absolutely. And one of the wonderful things about the cottages 
is that because it is so home-like, we try to um, you know, include anything that you might find in an individual's home that would help their, their life. And because it is a smaller environment, it's a lot easier for people to get around who have low vision. Um, there are computers and large computer screens in every house, and we have um, you know, some of the devices on some of the computers that can help with their reading. We have computer classes that are actually being taught in every one of our cottages to any elder that wishes to so that they can get on the computer and read books and the largest font that they can. Um, so we do try to use as many of those as possible. And again, because they're such small houses, um, when you're working with 10 people, you know, you can try a lot of different things as far as the technological advances that are out there. And if they don't work, you move on and you try something else. So. Well, that's wonderful. And you're confirming what I suspected, that y'all are already on top of that. Thank you. Absolutely. But thank you. I will definitely pass it along to our, our people down there. And if they have some other needs, then I'll definitely connect them with you. Thank you. All right. Well, thank you both, Jennifer and Maria, for bringing this great program. You know, it just makes me feel happy to hear about it. Uh, so uh, we thank you. We've put up the screen with Jennifer's contact information and the website for St. Martin's in the Pines. So by all means, contact her or Maria at the Daniel Foundation of Alabama. And uh, if you have other questions about this, and uh, but thank you very much. Um, don't forget to fill out the little one-question survey as you leave the Ready Talk sign. At this particular moment, we do not have a September webinar on the schedule. I am still hopeful that we might, uh, but we do have a great program scheduled for October 17th. The Arkansas Community Foundation will discuss Aspire Arkansas and talk about how they use their indicators project to inform donors and other investors about issues, including aging, in each county in the state. So I'm hoping uh, some, if not all of you, will be with us on October 17th. Uh, is there any other, are there any other announcements for the good of the cause? And Patty, this will be on YouTube, right, for us all? Oh, yes, yes. Later. I'm sorry. We will have this on YouTube, hopefully by Friday, but it may be next week. Mm -hmm. Yes. All right. Well, thank you all so much. We appreciate your time and your attention, and we certainly appreciate Jennifer and Maria for pulling this program together. Thank you so mm -hmm. much. Thank you. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thank you. Thank you. Please stand by.